Controlled observational studies are a little bit better, or are better. Uh, Steve, uh, Dr. Pearson had referred to these earlier also. Really, we're mostly talking about cohort studies and case control studies here. Uh, really, for interventions, primarily cohort studies. The cohort group, the control group, does help us distinguish the specific effects of treatment from nonspecific effects, so that's definitely a step up. Uh, but you do require proper selection of control patients and interventions, and there's a strong potential for what we call confounding, that there are other factors that explain the uh, effects other than treatment effects. Con what we call con refer to by confounding by indication is very prominent in studies of treatment efficacy. I'll talk about what that means in a second. And residual confounding is likely even if we use techniques to try to address it. So this is one technique that we use to control for confounding. It's called matching, right? You match patients so that they look pretty similar. This is just an example. Again, I borrowed from Rick Dio. We, write, we wrote a book chapter for the Bonica textbook on uh, randomized controlled trials uh, where you could literally, you could be matching things on five different topics and literally be comparing apples and oranges. Uh, people are much more complicated. We've actually shown that you can match people on 20 or more uh, uh, clinical characteristics and still miss the one or two really important ones. Confounding by indication refers to the strong and appropriate tendency of clinicians to use interventions in people who we think are most likely to benefit from them. This is what we should be doing as clinicians. It's not a bad thing from a clinical standpoint. It's a bad thing from an interpretation standpoint. It's very difficult to eliminate these effects. So we have some examples. If you take new users of NSAIDs, this was a big pharmacoepidemiologic study, the risk of bleeding was actually 10 times higher in people prescribed a PPI compared to those not prescribed a PPI. Does this mean that PPIs are causing bleeds in people who take NSAIDs? No, it means that, that clinicians are making decisions to prescribe NSAIDs and uh, PPIs in people who they think are most likely to bleed if they give them NSAIDs. We've seen the same kind of things with uh, uh, cimetidine and gastric cancer, beta agonists and death associated with asthma, et cetera. Uh, so these effects of confounded by indication are very strong and they shouldn't be ignored or downplayed at all. We have lots of examples of misleading observational studies. Uh, so if you look at studies of TENS, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, it was effective in 17 of 19, almost every observational study found it to be effective, but only two out of 17 randomized controlled trials did. If you look at intradiscal electrothermal therapy, uh, there was a non-randomized controlled study performed by Dr. Bogduk that found a four and a half point average benefit on a zero to 10 point scale of IDET compared to no IDET. Um, but we know the randomized controlled trials have shown an average of zero, no benefit, or one point of a benefit. Um, so the non-randomized study was exaggerating the treatment effect 400%. Even large, well-conducted cohort studies end up being overturned by RCTs. Everybody knows what happened with hormone re replacement therapy for prevention of coronary artery disease. We were exposing women to hormone replacement therapy to reduce their, their uh, heart attack risk, and now we found that it doesn't reduce their heart attack risk, and there are some side effects, and some of those side effects are serious. Vitamin E for prevention of coronary artery disease. There are numerous other examples. So what can we use observational studies for? Well, observational studies can be very valuable for evaluating the uncommon or long-term adverse effects that are hard to look at in RCTs. They can be helpful for natural history, prognosis, and looking at effectiveness. This is what uh, Dr. Pearson was referring to. Once you know something has worked in ideal conditions, which are what most RCTs are conducted in, you want to know whether it works in real life. And that's when observational studies can help you, but there's a prerequisite that you need to know whether it works in ideal conditions first. Uh, so they can be useful for learning the outcomes of interventions when physicians and patients apply their own perceptions and biases to the decision-making process. Their usefulness for evaluating the effect efficacy of medical interventions uh, is really quite limited. Uh, you can't use them to resolve discrepancies between high... If you have two randomized controlled trials that give different results, it makes no sense to take a bunch of observational studies and say, well, this, you know, solves the problem. You need better randomized controlled trials. Uh, and they're usually, uh, and I would argue that for chronic low back pain, uh, that they are too unreliable to establish efficacy. There are a lot of other groups that have looked at this for a long time in terms of how do you look at observational studies. I've been doing U U.S. Preventive Services Task Force reviews for about 10 years now. 
Um, and we almost never base its recommendations on observational studies of screening or treatment. Uh, we use observational studies, but they're used to look at diagnostic testing, uh, prognosis, you know, risk prediction, those kinds of things. If we are stuck with controlled observational studies, uh, it usually ends up in a poor quality recommendation, insufficient to generate recommendations. Uh, we just did a thing on bladder cancer screening where we have three cohort studies, pretty big cohort studies, a couple hundred patients each, uh, but uh, there's problems with the cohort studies and it's an insufficient evidence thing. We don't think there's enough there to recommend bladder cancer screening. Uncontrolled studies are almost always excluded. Um, or their use is very limited, and that might be if we're looking at a particularly rare harm that we can't pick up any other way. The AHRQ Effective Healthcare Program, which I also do work for, I write methods for them and work on methods for them. Uh, we rec they recommend using observational studies to fill in gaps that aren't or can't be addressed by RCTs. This was just released by AHRQ a couple of weeks ago, and they have a framework for when do you select observational studies for comparing medical interventions. This is for the Comparative Effectiveness Program. So one, are there gaps in the RCT evidence for the review questions under consideration? So you don't use them when there aren't gaps. And the second, and I think more important maybe, is will observational studies provide valid and useful information to address key questions? The quote is that poor quality evidence from observational studies should not be used or relied on even if it appears to address gaps in the trial evidence. Internal validity is always central to answering a review question. In some clinical circumstances, the likelihood of one or more of these biases affecting studies is so high that observational studies can be excluded as a group prior to detailed review of the body of observational evidence. I would argue that this Bogduke study gives us a pretty strong rationale for not placing a lot of faith in controlled observational studies. Um, and I don't think that case series really has any role at all. Uh, and most, uh, many people would agree with me. This is a uh, quote, these are a couple of quotes from a paper by Jan Vandenbroek. Uh, this was in JAMA in 2008. Uh, randomized trials are uniquely superior to evaluate the benefits, the intended or hoped for effects of treatments. These guidelines, he was referring to a paper that I wrote from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, clearly separate the use of observational evidence for beneficial effects for which the possibilities are scant and the use of the same type of evidence for harms for which the possibilities are rich. On to randomization. So uh, we've all talked, we, everybody knows about randomization. Uh, we like randomization because well-conducted RCTs are their least susceptible study design to confounding and bias. There are issues, of course, with RCTs, but in terms of, the, of limiting confounding and bias, that's the best way to do it. Randomization eliminates the problem of confounding given you have a large enough sample and do the randomization properly. And it works because it works for even unmeasured or unknown confounders, of which there are usually many. There's two components required for effective randomization. First, you need to generate a truly random sequence, and then you need to actually successfully implement that sequence. This shows why we think randomization is important. This is studies of myocardial infarction treatments. If you had uh, adequate allocation concealment, your likelihood of finding a positive treatment effect was 9%. If you had inadequate allocation concealment, it was 24%, so many more positive results. And if it was non-randomized, 58%, so six times more likely to give you a positive result. There are many sources of potential bias in clinical trials, so just because something's an RCT doesn't mean it's reliable or useful. And bias really refers to systematic error due to flaws in the conduct or design of studies. And there are many potential sources of bias. These are all included in the quality measures that we use to look at these studies, uh, ranging from inadequate randomization to baseline differences, lack of blinding, et cetera, et cetera. Critical appraisal is based on the principle that not all evidence is created equal. We want to look at the quality or your confidence that the trial design has minimized biases. Um, and consider the study uh, on the study on a design-based evidence hierarchy. And again, the principle is that we want to focus on good quality studies from higher levels in the evidence hierarchy. The method that the APS used, uh, when we talk about a high quality body of evidence, that means that we have a high confidence in the results, that we really don't think that new research is going to change the conclusions. All right. The APS Adapted Methods from GRADE, that's an, in, that's an acronym for an international working group that has been trying to sort through these issues, as well as the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. 
Our evidence grids were based on a systematic review of primary studies. There's been some misconceptions that we base recommendations on prior guidelines and other systematic reviews. No, we didn't. For the interventional therapies and surgeries, we relied on the primary studies. Uh, we did discuss some of these other reports, but it's all background material, uh, which is standard in these reports. You want to know what other people have done or looked at. The grade method for evaluating a body of evidence is you take all the studies that are relevant to the question at hand. RCTs begin as high quality evidence, and then a number of things can kind of drop you down. So poor quality, inconsistent results, which I'm going to hammer on later, indirectness of evidence, sparse evidence, so few studies, another important issue, and reporting or publication bias. This is a paper from John Yanidis which got a lot of uh, attention when it was published a few years ago. He points out that most published research findings are false. We're right to actually be suspicious about stuff that we read. The positive predictive value, so the likelihood that a true, that a, you know, a positive effect is actually true, actually ranges from 0.17 to 0.41. Less than half the time it's actually going to end up to be a true effect. Um, this is based on a lot of information about pretest probabilities and kind of Bayesian theorems and stuff. The things that, de act, that will actually decrease that positive predictive value more are having smaller studies, if the effect sizes are relatively small, if you have more liberal use of study designs, or if there are strong financial interests. Most in st true associations are inflated. Uh, so most of the results we see or estimates of effect are actually higher than reality. We know that early studies give larger estimates of effects than later studies. This is why we should be suspicious when we, get, when we see initial reports. Results of even large, highly cited trials are overturned about 20% of the time by subsequent research. This was a paper published by John Yanidis in JAMA about three years ago. And we often see positive initial results followed by negative trials. This is called the Proteus effect. Proteus was the Greek god that like, jumped around all the time or something. Um, and we know about publication and other related biases. This is a slide that just shows that smaller samples, so this is, these are a bunch of different uh, meta-analyses, and they looked at the sample size as related to the estimate of the effect of the odds ratio. So if you had a very small sample size, about 100 patient, the uh, uh, odds ratio was about you know, 8 to 10 or something like that, whereas if you got to 1,000 patients or, or 10,000 patients, um, the odds ratio was only 1.5. So small sample sizes give you inflated estimates of effect. 